I am a guard in a hidden prison located in the Arctic. Something is horrifying about the inmates. And somehow, one of them knew every single detail of my life. The warden called me into his office on a Monday. During the entire walk there down the hallways, I thought of the trouble I could be in. Shut the door, he said as he looked up at me from his desk after I entered. Those words sealed it in my mind, how much hot water I was in for some sort of infraction I was not aware of yet. Bureaucratic micromanaging and constant procedural changes were nothing new to me. I still hated petty political grievances. I nodded and sealed the entranceway. He demanded I take a seat, so I did. You're the best officer here, he said. I waited for the butt. I anticipated news of termination. I saw a force transfer to some mundane position filing paperwork headed my way. I want to give you an opportunity, he said. You will make 600,000 in one year. Your benefits will remain unchanged. You would have less oversight than what is present for you now. You would be in a leadership position, albeit an isolated one. That sounds ideal, I said as my mind swam in the possibilities of how much profit he offered. There are only two things we ask of you. One is that you cannot tell anybody about your new position. Two is you locate somewhere else. There's a prison in the Arctic, and that is where your life will be for the next 365 days. The confusion must have been readable on my face. If your wife asks, tell her that you are going to a federal academy. There is no cell service or Wi-Fi there. Any contact you make with her must be through snail mail. We will handle the addresses given. If you decline this offer, then this conversation never happened. Do you understand? I contemplated the pros and cons. Before I became law enforcement, I was a bodyguard. I was gone from the house for extended periods. Even though it would be time with the wife lost, the fortune would help both of us. I agreed. The prison facility was a large compound not much bigger than the place I had patrolled before. A few things jumped out at me when I first laid eyes on the populace there. They all had wounds on their faces, and they spoke a strange guttural language I was unfamiliar with. The new warden I worked under had the last name of Buckley. He had noticeable scar tissue beneath his eyes. His attitude towards me at the beginning was hardly welcoming. If anything, he acted as though I was a burden. He seemed to resent me due to the mere possibility of having to train me on things. One evening, Buckley ordered me to do a cell extraction. Christopher Aluko was the name of the inmate we had to deal with. On the walk there, I asked my boss what Aluko had done to end up here. I'm not allowed to tell you what these scumbags have accomplished to wind up here, Buckley said. He started his career in crime by cannibalizing his sister, though. Tonight, our only goal is to get him moved to the hole. He's proven himself to be way too dangerous to share a space with anyone. The doors of each cell were closer to that of an insane asylum than a prison. They were complete barriers that you could not see through. It was me and three other guards who were about to deal with this high-profile detainee. The supervisor was present, doing the thing the bosses generally do. That is to say, he remained on standby and did not get his hands dirty. Upon walking in, the first thing I saw was Aluko sitting upright on his cot. I noticed he was huge, at least 6 foot 8 and 320 pounds of pure muscle. His skin cracked all over. His face had the normal scarring that I associated with most people in the place. I'm going to need you to stand up and put your hands behind your back, I said. I kept my hand near the holster where my pepper spray was. Show me respect and I'll show you the same, I continued. You won't have handcuffs on you for long if you cooperate. You are not better than me, Aluko said. His voice had a baritone quality, which I expected from a man of his size. What I did not was how weird it sounded. It was as though four or five people were chanting the words in unison. All right, I said. Let's get you moved to where you need to go. The faster we do this, the better off we'll be. You shot at someone in broad daylight when you were in a gang years ago, Aluko said. It took ten years for the paranoia to go away. The fear of the cops coming to arrest you for a potential murder before you became a low-grade one yourself. To this day, you don't know if any innocent civilians got caught in the crossfire. We had to restrain his huge arms and place the metal bracelets on his wrists. He laughed all the while. As we brought him to solitary, I thought of his words and how much they unsettled me. They were true, and that story from my past was one I had not told anybody. Near the end of the shift, Buckley went into one of the sniper towers and smoked a cigarette. Since my duties for the day were complete, I took the spiral staircase to the level he stood on. When I saw him, I was only a few mere inches away from where he puffed. He did not seem to mind or even care about the footsteps behind him. He focused on the distant and lowering winter sun. I need to know what kind of prison this is, I said as I felt blood rush to my head. Why does everyone have open sores all over their body and face? Either that or they're always high on something. That would explain why they're always speaking gibberish. Also, how in the hell do they know things that I haven't even told the closest people in my life? Better to do the job aside. Don't worry about things above your pay grade. Buckley pulled out another pack of cigarettes and lit one. I hope we're not exposed to dangers we weren't warned about. I'll have to find a way to get the word out. If you break your non-disclosure agreement, it would be far worse than a termination. Your wife back home, the one with the dark curly hair and the nice curves? I'd hate to see the impact of your decisions on her. That was when I grabbed him by the lapels and shoved him to the ground. I considered throwing elbows. The idea of making him taste his blood was satisfying. I did not want to be incarcerated in this den of misery though, of all places. Buckley started laughing. What he did next took me by complete surprise. He patted me on the back with his free hand instead of trying to defend himself or resist. You've proven your point, he said as he pushed on my chest. Now get off of me. I don't want to give the signal to one of my buddies in the next tower. He has a modded Remington 700 pointed at you. I released him. 
After he stood and brushed some frost off, he made a contact with me. I respect you for your bravery. Most people wouldn't be willing to do that to me, especially someone beneath me in rank. Tell you what, I'll shed a little bit of light on what kind of place this is for you. And if I ever find out you told anyone, you'll wish you would have died at birth. I felt the adrenaline start to wear off. As my energy lowered, I nodded, thereby giving tacit agreement to his new offer. I looked to my left and saw the sniper he was referring to. It occurred to me that if he wanted to take action against me, he could have had me executed right then and there. Buckley waved at me to follow him as we made our way down the steps. He escorted me through the yard. Ice encased the weight sets and pull-up bars. We followed the chain-link fence to another facility that had coded key access. After we put in the correct digits, he swung the door open. We made our way down a hallway that did not seem modern. There were lit torches on the walls. The flooring was pallid cobblestone. He brought me into another room which was the size of an auditorium. A man stood up. He wore all black clothing with a white collar, and it took me a while to recognize him as a priest. I saw rows of long tables, ones fit for a king in an ancient era. Crucifixes, rosaries, chalices of water, and stacks of dusty books lined every corner. I skimmed some of the titles and saw that a few were in a different language. Father Lamora, Buckley said as he stared at the man of the cloth, what are you doing down here? The priest pointed to his left. When I shifted my eyes in that direction, I did not immediately notice the presence of a fourth person in the room. This one was one of the inmates tied down on a slab. As soon as we focused our collective attention on him, the man came to life. He started struggling against his restraints. A red-tinged substance poured from his mouth like foam from a rabid dog. I have almost driven the evil entity out, the priest said. Buckley turned to me. What is going on here? I asked. I had the irresistible urge to run screaming in the other direction. I knew I could not take my chances out in the harshest cold, but a part of me was willing to at least try. Buckley took a deep drag from his cigarette, blowing out a cloud of smoke before he started to speak. This ain't an ordinary prison. Hell, this ain't a prison for humans. You've noticed the wounds, the strange speech, the impossible knowledge of personal secrets. We're not here to guard murderers or thieves. We're here to contain something far more. Ancient, far more evil. Don't be cryptic, Buckley. What are you talking about? I demanded, my voice raising with every word. Buckley pointed a finger at the writhing inmate on the slab. The man's eyes were rolled back in his head, only the white showing. The scarred skin on his face seemed to pulse and shift as if something beneath was trying to break out. This here, this is a prison for demons, he said. My blood ran cold. You're joking, I whispered, but the dreadful seriousness on his face confirmed my worst fears. He nodded slowly, and Father Lamora is our exorcist. Our job is to contain them. His job is to try and save the human host. But it's been years since he's had a success. Father Lamora's chant was escalating in volume, in intensity. The room vibrated with his words. Suddenly, the inmate shrieked, a terrifying sound that echoed off the walls and rang in my ears. His body convulsed violently, straining against his restraints. And then, silence. Slowly, the man's eyes slid back to their normal position. The convulsion stopped, and he slumped against the slab, gasping for breath. The priest released a heavy sigh, wiping his sweat-beaded forehead with the back of his hand. The ordeal appeared to be over, for now. How did they get here, these? Demons? I found myself asking, my mind racing to comprehend the reality of my situation. That's a story for another day, Buckley answered, his gaze firmly on the still gasping inmate. Buckley walked out of my vision. I was so caught up with staring at the prisoner that I didn't realize the sudden click behind me. My hands were brought together, and I heard the voice of Buckley reappear. And that's why you're here. Because you're under arrest. It all happened so fast that I didn't even resist. He threw out the other treated prisoner, and put me in his place, on the slab. Suddenly, when Buckley was walking away from me, his eyes were cold and unyielding. Oh, and one more thing. Aluko, the inmate you moved today. He's not just an inmate. He's the oldest and most powerful among them all. And now, he knows you. The thought of the demon's grotesque face, his unsettling, inhuman voice, the knowledge of my darkest secret. It all made sense now. I always wondered what brought me to shoot a man in broad daylight.